How many of us in here are Sabbath keepers? Pretty much everybody here? Okay. Because I want to say a few things, and I don't want to offend people that are not. So, <laughs> you just gave me some freedom. <laughs> okay. It's been a while since I've been plugged in. I used to do this quite a bit, and... Um, Last 10 or 12 years, I've kind of disappeared, and somehow people have found out about me again. I guess I have to get wired up for sound. Okay. Our topic this evening, and I don't think we're going to get very far in it, but we're going to try. And, and like I share with our Sabbath group, I don't know what, quite where we're going to end up, but we're going to end up somewhere in our discussion. And so our discussion this evening, and this may be a little loud because I've got a loud voice in and of itself. Is that too loud for y'all? Okay. Because um, I can kind of blow your ears off real easy, and I don't know why that is, but I've got one of those kind of voices. Our discussion tonight is preparing for Christ's second coming. How many of us really believe that? Does your life testify of it? Because we can talk the talk, but the walk is going to tell what your talk really is. And if there was ever a time in earth's history that Christ is nearer at hand, it is now. And as we look at a few things this evening, we've got a lot of territory to cover. And I don't know how far we're going to get into it. But we're going to look at a few things dealing with the second coming. I remember years ago, not too many years ago, about a year ago actually, I was in a vehicle with a friend of mine, but a Christian man, he's more new age, I guess you would say. And because my background has been where it's at, he kind of was real comfortable. We grew a pretty good relationship. We were driving down the road, and we were somewhere out there in Tennessee, and we went through this area out of a little township, and there was this great big sign on the side of the road that says, Jesus is coming soon. I'd seen that sign many times before. You know what he said to me? He said, they've been talking about that for years. He hasn't come yet, has he? I asked myself that question in silence. Wow, what do I say? What do I say? Is he waiting for the world to become more wicked? Well, this is a classroom, not a preacher. Is he waiting for the world to become more wicked so that he can come back? What is he waiting for? Now, we're all on a little book, and most of you are probably familiar with it. Christ Object Lessons. I wasn't familiar with these books. I came out of the hippie movement. And somehow the Lord took me to these little red books, and I started reading them. I didn't know I was supposed to believe them. When I started believing them, it really started changing my life. And there's a statement in here I want to read to you folks with what we're going to be discussing tonight, right? Let me get over there real quick. My poor book is falling apart. This is in the chapter, first the blade, then the air, and then the full cord in the air. If you want a really nice study, Go study that parable. At the end of this chapter, there's a little statement that I've marked quite heavy because it affected me very, very much. It says, Christ is waiting with longing desire. What does that mean? How long does he have to wait? 
with longing desire. What we're going to be discussing tonight, I hope, I hope we can hear from here. The Lord's not waiting for the world to become more wicked to return. Even though those things are part to help us to know where we are in time. Is that right? Christ is waiting with longing desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. What is he waiting for, brother? That's right. He's waiting for his manifestation in your lives. I've read this statement over and over again, and I ask myself seriously, Lord, does my life reflect your life? That others might see a Jesus that they've never seen before. And I'm going to tell you, over and over again, it's humbled me. And put me on my knees in prayer to realize, Lord, that's the reason why you're not coming back yet, yet. That's why you haven't come back, because my life is not reflecting your image. Huh? Ever ask yourself that question? Why is it? Why is it that Jesus hasn't come back yet? Is he waiting for the world to become more wicked? He says here, he's longing and waiting and desire for the manifestation of himself in his church. When the character of Christ shall be perfectly reproduced within his people, then he will come to claim them as his own. So when we talk about this subject about preparing for the second coming, in conjunction with this whole theme about homesteading, <laughs> I've had a very difficult time trying to get things in my head wrapped around. What does homesteading have to do with Jesus coming? Come on, this is a classroom, please. <laughs> what does homesteading have to do with Jesus' coming? Okay, we're going to look a little bit tonight. And I hope and pray what I share with you tonight will be just enough to stimulate your minds and move you in a direction of study and search for answers. Because let me tell you something, folks. There's a lots of folks moving to the land right now without Jesus. All across this country, homesteading is not going to save them from what's coming. Do you, do you wrap that around your mind? If Christ is not in the homesteading, then what we're doing is is just preparing ourselves for something even worse. I've met a lot of folks, believe me, because of our lifestyle and the way we've been living for years. I've tried to figure out who in the world we are because we're not Amish, we're not Mennonite, uh, we're not New Agers, we're not back to landers, any, you know, and all that. And they're trying to figure out who in the world we are. Well, I just want to let you know. I got a hold of this little book long, long time ago. It's called Country Living. Now, I know they have a case of books out there with this in it. And every one of you need one of these if you don't have it. I remember reading this, and I didn't even know these thoughts existed. And it catapulted me before I was married. And I've been married for almost 44 years. And this happened before I met my wife. And it pushed me in a direction of realizing I need to be living in the country. Now, how do you do that? I was a city boy. I grew up in a city environment. That's all I knew. And so it became a lifelong study <laughs> of 
how to live on the land and with the land. And I'm going to tell you something from my heart. If you don't have Jesus, you'll burn out. And you'll go right back to your easy living. Because everything about homesteading is not easy. Physically, mentally, and morally, it is very draining. And the only strength you're going to have as you move to the country is Jesus. He will be your strength and your help through all the struggles that you'll go through on the land. And why? Why, why really do we want to be doing that? If you all have your Bibles, I would like to look at a few things tonight, and we're just going to scratch a few things. We won't be able to really exhaust much, but we're going to look at it. In the book of Matthew, in chapter 24, most of us are all probably pretty familiar with Matthew chapter 24. And if you're not, you need to become familiar with it. Because there's something very interesting in this chapter that years ago, as I had studied this chapter and was reading through it, it was very confusing. Have you ever been through that? Because it seems to go in so many different directions. And yet the thought that was brought up in this chapter is just simply in verse 3, it says, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him, Privately saying, tell us, when shall these things be? Now tomorrow afternoon we're going to discuss when shall these things be and what in the world were they asking? Chapter right before it was a discussion on dealing with something that was coming upon Jerusalem. Is that right? Jesus was brokenhearted with what he saw and he was going through with his own people. And so when Jesus launched into this discussion in Matthew chapter 23, it had everything to do with Jerusalem. And it's very interesting, in chapter 24, you see this picture being put together by Jesus under divine energy alone. That he takes this picture of Jerusalem and he superimposes it, if you please, upon the end of the world. He showed what was coming on Jerusalem is going to come on the end of the world. And in this discussion, he started laying out a lot of information that would help us to know where we are in time. Is that right? And tomorrow afternoon, we're going to look at some of that, dealing with Jerusalem specifically in some of these things that Jesus left there for us to see. Because there are things there for us to see to help us to know where we are. How many of us believe Jesus is coming soon? I hope you mean that. Because I tell you, if there was ever a time in this earth's history, it is now. I told this fellow that we were driving in the car together when he saw that sign. He said, they've been saying this for a long time, Ron. He knew I was a believer in Christ. He knew I wasn't a new agent because we've known each other for a while already. But it was kind of a slap towards Christianity. Now, I don't know what church put it up there on the board, but the truth of the matter is it didn't matter. Because that was the truth. Jesus is coming soon. But when he said that, I said, Gary, I said, I want to say something to you, and I hope you listen. If there was ever a time in earth's history that Jesus is coming soon, it is now. More than it's ever been. I said, there are things in the Bible that portray and give us answers to what to be looking for before he comes. And I quoted a number of things out of chapter 24 of Matthew to him. And he got real silent. And what we're going to look at tonight. 
in this chapter. I'm not going to break this whole chapter down for you, but we're just going to pick a few things out of it if you all don't mind. All right? Again, there in verse 23, it says, When shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming? What are we to look for? I mean, I don't know about you. If I would have been sitting there listening to this conversation, I think my head would have been spinning off. Because Jesus started talking to these men, and all of a sudden he launched into this discussion with them, and it was like one subject about his second coming, and he merged two kind of events together in this discussion. And you have to work through this thing and trying to work it out to try to understand what part belongs to Jerusalem and what part belongs to the end of time. And yet it looks like these things talked about Jerusalem. He's talking about the end of time. Is that right? Yeah. Then he said, or they asked him, what shall be the sign of thy coming? And the end of the world. So what was on these fellows' minds? Tell us. When shall these things be? Alright, the first thing. They asked him. That was referring, and we will talk about this tomorrow, that was referring back to the previous chapter, chapter 23, when Jesus was standing on Mount Olive, broken hearted and crying for Jerusalem. He was crying for his people. I don't know how much you all know about your Bibles or not, but we are all a part of those people. You do know that, right? There was only three men besides mom and dad that got off that boat with their wives. Is that right? Ham, Sham, and Japheth. It was those three boys that have populated the world that we know of. And it's absolutely shown in biblical scripture where these three boys went and populated the world. That's a whole other subject. So that when Jesus was weeping over Jerusalem, he wasn't just weeping over Jerusalem because Jesus was seeing what was going on with his people throughout history. All the way to the end, what shall be the sign of that coming and of the end of the world? So when Jesus began his lecture or his discussion with his disciples, I want you to realize that as Jesus was talking about this that was coming upon Jerusalem, it was as though he was talking about what was coming upon the end of the world. Why do you think, why do you think there are so many people right now so crazy about homesteading? Come on, church. Come on, sister, say it. Because they sense something's coming. I believe the Spirit of God is working upon the people Jesus was talking about and weeping over. And yet a lot of folks don't even know what's happening, and they don't even know and don't even realize that the Spirit of God is moving them in a direction. I have talked to so many people asking them, I said, why are you leaving California? Why are you leaving the New, the New England states and coming down here into the country and buying these lands and, 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 and trying to figure out how to grow your food and your animals and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera? He says, we don't know. We just know something's coming. How many people know that? What would you say? How many people are know of that? Yes, yes. You know, and believe me, I stand up here with my head swirling. 
just to try to, try to start in this discussion because we're living in a world right now of people knowing something is about to break. And we sit here in this church with the information and I wonder, what are we doing with it? Do you know who those people are going to look to? Those people that are not even Christians? Yeah, they're going to be looking to us. They're looking for answers, brethren. They're looking for answers. And so, as we spend these few moments together, I hope and pray that God will give me the grace to deal with some of this stuff because honestly and truthfully, I don't want to see y'all go to the homestead without Jesus. Amen. And I mean that. I've been there. I know how hard it is. I have lived every aspect of homesteading you can talk about. And I know how hard it is. And it wasn't until I really fell in love with Jesus that I found my real purpose in life. My real purpose in life was preparing my family a place and helping others to prepare a place for what's coming. That's what we're going to discuss tonight out of chapter 24 at the time of Noah. Do you know what Noah was? Now, in this discussion, amen, brother, he was a believer. And I mean, he was a real believer. In fact, the Bible says he was a preacher of righteousness. For a, yeah, absolutely. For a hundred, for a hundred and twenty years? You know, when you go back to the record in Genesis chapter 6, something very interesting jumps out at you when that commission was first given to Noah. He wasn't given necessarily a time frame when this thing was going to come. He was just told the Lord to prepare an ark for his family and the saving of mankind if they would you know, take heed to the message. And so Noah launched out into this journey, didn't he? Now it's interesting. In this discussion in Matthew chapter 24, the second coming comes up in this chapter nine times. And every time it comes up, there's a little more information given with it. So I want you to go sometime and take Matthew 24 and look up those nine times that it's mentioned and see what kind of information comes before or even after the mentioning of that coming. All right? Because it is there. So, one of the big things that Jesus said after he talked to his disciples, or they were asking him the questions, those three questions, he says, take heed, verse 4, take heed that no man deceive you. Deceive you about what? Of oh, his coming. There, very good. So Jesus was trying to help his disciples to know what to look for. What was coming upon Jerusalem and what was coming upon the world and his second coming. Now, we're going to come back to this chapter tomorrow afternoon. We're going to look at a few things in it, but what I want to do here, if you don't mind, is I want to look just a little bit about this, this situation with Noah. You go all the way over to verse 36. We're going to come back to some of these other verses and discuss some of those tomorrow. But right here this evening, we're going to look a little bit at 36 and a few verses down. In verse 36 it says, But of the day and the hour knoweth no man, know not the angels of heaven, but the Father only. 
The day and the hour of what? Our subject tonight is the second coming, preparing for the second coming. Jesus told them we don't know the day nor the hour. Do you know what he said just before that? He gives them an event of certain things that, were, that came upon the earth at a certain time in history. And he told them we can know, verse 33 says, we can know it's even at the door. We may not know the day and the hour per se, but it's interesting that Jesus let the church know that we can know it's even at the door. What does that mean to you? I said it earlier. People are asking. People that I meet, they're asking, what is going on? They sense that something's coming, but they don't know what it is. What do you suppose that is that they're sensing? Anybody have any ideas? <laughs> well, Jesus said, don't be deceived by all the input of all these people in the world and the politics that's going on in the world. A lot of people are concerned with what's going on in politics right now. Is there any good politics? No. Has politics always been? Ever since ancient Babylon, there's been political strife. There's a lot of talk about the currency of the world being changed into one world currency right now, a digital currency. You know that, right? Yeah. To where they're going to wipe everything you've worked for out and put you on a one common currency. And we talk about no buying, no selling. People that know very little, when I was coming, when I was still in the hippie movement, we used to sit down as long-haired hippies talking about, you know, there's coming a time that you won't be able to buy or sell. You remember that? Now, some of you probably don't even, are not old enough to even remember any of that. And I hope and pray you all didn't have any part of that. Because there was not much good in it. But there was discussion back there in the 60s and 70s by these long-haired hippies that were asking the questions, what is that all about anyways? What is this thing about called no buying, no selling? You know what it escalated these hippies into? We were called back the landers. You ever heard that saying? We now call it homesteaders. And so it escalated a lot of these people with a lot, of, a lot of baggage, but it escalated them into living on the land and growing your food and a lot of other things. But it moved them in a direction that helped them to get back to the land and learn how to grow food and do it all organically away from chemicals and all that stuff. So there are things that are happening in this country right now. Not just in this country, it's worldwide. There is a grand movement of people being concerned. What are we going to do when they take our food away from us? I asked the question earlier. How much wickeder does it got to get for Jesus to come? Does it need to get more wicked? You mentioned about problems in all these, but also medicine also is a problem. <laughs> you don't even want to get me started on that one, brother. <laughs> yeah. But we talk about this thing about Noah. What was it like at the time of Noah? Jesus happened to go into that talking about the situation about Noah. When's the last time you looked up the thing about Noah? What was the problem at the time of Noah? Do we need to go back to chapter 6 and 7 and 8 of Genesis and look at it? It says their minds 
were continually wicked. Now it's interesting. I really didn't want to discuss that, but I guess I'm going to do it anyways. Luke chapter Luke chapter 17. In Luke chapter 17 and starting with verse 26, which is a piece of Matthew chapter 24, in verse 37 and, and a few texts after that, 37, 38, 39, in Luke chapter 17, this is what the Lord says. He says here, and Luke's writing it down, and as it was, verse 26, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be also in the day of the Son of Man, the coming of the Son of Man. So if you want to know how soon we are to Jesus' return, go back and look at the story of Noah. Is that fair? They did eat. Is there something wrong with eating? What was wrong with their eating? Genesis says everything they did was continually wicked. Even in their eating, it was to the excess. Have you ever lived in this world and seen what's going on in the sport world? The excess of sports to a place that it's unbelievable? Everything in the minds of man today is to the full excess. As it was in the days of Noah, they were eating, they were drinking, they were marrying wives. How many wives? They were given in marriage until the day of Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed every last one of them. Now there's something very interesting in this text. Then he launches out about Lot. In Matthew, he doesn't talk about Lot. In Luke, he, he joins this up with what was going on at the time of Noah. It was like what was going on at the time of Lot. Now, if you want a, a, a study that will make you sick, go study about Lot in Sodom. The very thing I quoted to this brother, I said, let me tell you something, my friend. If Jesus doesn't come back soon, I will be very surprised. This is because he said, as it was in the days of Lot, in Sodom and Gomorrah, so shall it be at the time of the coming of the Son of Man. Mm -hmm. If the condition of the world is not akin to where Sodom was, I'm blind and dumb and ignorant. We as believers see that. But you know there are people in this world that are not believers in Christ that see it as well. They're trying to figure out how far reaching does this wickedness got to get? I want to get my children away from this influence. I just got chills up my spine just saying that. People are concerned for their little ones. And the influence that is all around us now of the sodomite mentality. And yet we're told that those things will be happening right before the, the closing up of all things. Do you believe Jesus is coming back soon? Amen. The big question again is, what are you doing about it? Now, the Bible says very clearly, and I don't want to go into all the text, because I don't have a lot of time to do that. My time is going to run out right shortly. <laughs> But it says that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. Now let me tell you something, folks. For 120 years, 
Noah preached a message, and that message was a message of righteousness by faith. You all know that, right? In Hebrews chapter 11, it says, by faith, Noah. Want to go look at that? It's really, it's really interesting. Noah was not just preaching with his mouth, brethren. Every time he would hammer, every time he would saw, every time he would put a beam in its proper place, or chink it, or, or, or pitch it, or whatever he was doing on the ark, he was preaching a message of righteousness by faith. Mm. Turn with me to Hebrews. I can't help myself. <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11. It says by faith in verse 7. By faith, Noah. What is faith, by the way? How, how do you, in simple layman's term, explain faith? Believe something you can't see. The devils believe and tremble, sister. Is that faith? Faith is an absolute trust. An absolute trust. If it's God, then you have an absolute trust in Him as your Father. If it's a trust in Jesus, it's an absolute trust in your brother. That kind of trust builds a loving relationship that can't be broken. But it takes that kind of faith to have that ultimate trust and Noah had that kind of trust in the God that gave him the commission to do what he was asked to do. Did he not? Do you think he questioned God's authority? What do you think society said about this nut job that left everything and went out there and started doing that? Building an ark for the saving of mankind. Do you think society was in harmony with what he was doing? Every day that went by, every day they cut a tree down, every day they cut that tree into beams, every day they hammered them in their place, every day for a hundred and something days. We don't know exactly how long it took him to build that ark, but we do know it says that he preached the message for 120 years. You know how many years it's been since we were told to leave the cities and moved to the country? 125 years when the first council came out. That's in that little book I was telling you. Uh, country Living. We've had that council for 125 years. Alright? And it's interesting that Noah preached a message every day of his life Knowing that one day this thing's going to come. Now it says, No, by faith, being warned. Hmm. Ever look up words? I like to look up words. You know what the word warned? It says, Warned of God, of things not seen as yet. Had there ever scientifically ever been a flood? Had there ever been rain? Never heard of it. Much less ever seen it. I could imagine a scientist saying, this guy's a real nut job. These people are really crazy. They're whacked out. They're leaving their high-paying jobs. They're going out there in the middle of nowhere. And what are they doing anyways? Maybe none of you have experienced that, but I tell you, I did. <laughs> I felt the heat of what we were doing and taking our family. Our families on both sides, my wife and mine, thought we had lost our everlasting minds because I left a private practice in North Carolina to go follow the council. 
they literally thought I was crazy. They were worried about our children. You know, what kind of education are they going to get? Any of you feel that heat before? I can just imagine what Noah and his family felt from society of the time. But by faith, Noah being warned. The word warned there means be called or be admonished by God to do something that had never been done before. It says, um, warned of God of things not seen as yet. Moved with fear. What did that faith do to Noah? Now, this is just a Bible class. This isn't a sermon, so I want some input. What does the word moved mean? You know, when we talk about being moved by the Holy Spirit, what does that mean? <laughs> it means you come alive. <laughs> that's what it means. And that's exactly what this faith that Noah had it, when God spoke to him, he took God's word for what it said, right? And it motivated him. That's the very word. It motivated him into action. So his faith was not just believing in something. His faith was an absolute connection of trust. You all know the story about the woman in, at the time of Jesus that had an issue of blood, Right? What was it? Her touch? Thank you. It's very clear. It was her reaching out and her faith that connected her to divine power that enabled her to have something she didn't have normally. This is what happened to Noah. When Noah grabbed hold of what God said and believed it, and trusted what God's word meant. There's coming a flood upon the world. And I will destroy all mankind. God then gave him a commission to build an ark. Something that seemed to be so crazy. But he never questioned God's authority, did he? He just did it. Moved with fear. The word fear means with reverence. So when he moved forward to do this. It was with a respect for the counsel of God in his life that enabled him, empowered him to every day of his life to accomplish what was set before him. Prepared an ark. You know, I've thought of that a long time. Prepared an ark. What do you suppose that means? What do you think it means today? Well, well, some call it homesteading. <laughs> some call it back to landers. Some call it homesteading, farmsteading. But I'm going to tell you something. This wasn't a selfish situation. That Noah was involved with. What Noah was done, or doing, I should say, what Noah was doing was preparing an ark for the saving of mankind. It wasn't just for him and his family. We've got to think beyond our, our, our boundaries, brethren. Do you believe that? Yeah. I do. My wife and I just sat down the other evening and I says, Chris, I said, what are we going to do when we've got people that don't even know how to survive? And we know these things. And guess what? I get a telephone call from some sister down here asking me to come down here and tell you all how to live. And I was so blown away, I couldn't hardly believe myself. I told my wife, and get, I just now it just chills like a piano went up my spine just like that. Because I knew when you called and you asked me to come down here, I said, Lord, 
<laughs> I'm getting really choked up because we're in a time, brethren, and I'm talking heart to heart here. We're in a time of history that we have got to get busy building an ark. There are going to be people that know nothing about living on the land. And if we don't help them, they're going to starve. And there may be people that you just may not agree with 100%. You know what I mean? They may be from a different church affiliation. But the thing of it is, brother, we're going to have to get we're going to have to get past some boundaries. Noah had to get past some boundaries. We are all brethren. We are all of the descendants of Noah's ark. We got some folks in here that are from Asian background, I believe. One of Noah's sons. Created the whole Asiatic world. Y'all know that? We've got some African Americans in this, this congregation. Do you know one of Noah's sons created that whole continent? <laughs> and then you go over to Europe, the Caucasians were created by another one of his sons. Yes. And we're all brethren. <laughs> I get tore up inside. I thought I believed this as a hippie. And when I became a Christian, started studying, I'm like, wow, <laughs> this is incredible stuff. Because God has a people and we're all brethren. We all don't know that. But those that are walking like Noah, that in the book of Genesis chapter 6, God called him a righteous man because he believed by faith in what God had said. He looked out upon these people that were his family. And you think he wasn't concerned for the saving of the souls? So as we look at this story, and I'm, I'm got to stop. I'm just getting started. <laughs> that it literally says because of what Noah did, he was considered a righteous man. It says in the end of that text, it says here, he condemned the world. I went and looked up that word, condemned the world, the message that he had to bear, the message that he spoke, the message that he was doing, was doing what? He was condemning the world. You know what the word condemn here is? It was showing that he was in opposition of the direction the world was going. So Noah's life was going in the absolute opposite direction. And so everything Noah and his family was doing was absolutely diametrically opposed to where the world was going. And you know what it says? Because of this, he was an heir of righteousness by faith. What he was doing, God accounted him a righteous man because of the faith that he had in God. This faith that he had, and Noah had, empowered him to do something that was so radically different. I've asked a lot of folks that before. <laughs> and it gets just like it does right here. What about our faith? Is it a faith that empowers us to do something so radically different than society that we live around or in, or even your church brethren are doing? Is it that kind of faith? It's that kind of faith that God says he considered Noah a righteous man. All right. I'd like to go on, but I don't dare. <laughs> You'll know, probably have enough. But as we look at the story of Noah, I believe there's a lesson there because at the end of that chapter in, in Matthew 24, 
He said about this thing about Noah, he says in verse 39, he says, And knew not until the flood came, those that were eating and drinking and giving in marriage, the course of this world, which is the, the obeying of the flesh, Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2, that's the course of this world. So the whole course of this world was going in a way, and then Noah's went in a total absolute opposite way, but everything that Noah was doing was telling this, and he knew not until the flood came and took them all away. So shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. That's verse 39 in Matthew 24. Now, does it have to come upon us unaware? No. No. What are we doing about what we believe? Or what kind of faith that we have? I ask myself this over and over again. Am I really crazy? The last 30 years, 38 years, leaving everything behind that I once knew and was educated in to live this kind of life of homesteading? Believe me, I've questioned many, many times, but I keep going back to that same thing. God wants us to prepare an ark. He wants us to be ready, brethren. He doesn't want us to be blindsided with what's coming. But he doesn't want us just to sit idle either. He wants us to do what we can to warn the world of what's coming. And it just may be that your lives will be the salvation of those that don't know. Noah's, unfortunately, there was only eight souls that got on that ark. He was prepared for more souls than that. But thank God for the remnant. But it may be because of your righteous life that others will get on board. All right, let's close with prayer. That's probably enough for tonight anyway. Maybe you won't sleep tonight. <laughs> okay, let's close. Father in heaven, dear loving Jesus, we thank you for this time together tonight. As we've entered into the Sabbath hours and we've looked at a few thoughts this evening. We know, dear Jesus, that you're coming soon because the way things are. But we do want to be ready, dear Jesus. We want to be fit, and we want our lives to represent your life. Dear Jesus, I pray that you would help us to be the light that you want us to be, like Noah. Every day of his life, for those 120 years, and probably before that, and even after that, his life was an example of a man of faith and that you counted him a righteous man because he trusted in you fully. Oh Lord Jesus, help us, encourage us as we spend this weekend together discussing some of these things about homesteading and what our purpose is in doing such of that. Give us all wisdom and skill and ability. Give us a burning in our soul and in our heart to do what we know we've got to do when everything seems to be going against us. Thank you again for these dear folks that have been here this evening. Please encourage them and strengthen them as we continue to discuss these things. And may we find in you, dear Jesus, our only Savior. I do ask these things and thank you now. Amen. 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 Amen.